Hello everybody. Welcome to a special program that the Hardwick Gazette and HCTV are jointly doing to bring you interviews of the candidates in Vermont's primary election. The primary this year is August 13th. We'll be interviewing all the candidates in four Senate districts and five House districts that the 11 towns of the Hardwick Gazette are uh, represented by. So, You'll be able to watch these at hctv.us or read them at hardwickgazette.org and each uh, place will be linked to the other. So we'll bring you now interviews of your local candidates. Thanks for watching. So uh, I grew up in Cabot. Um, my parents bought our farm when I was three and pretty much lived there ever since. And uh, my wife and I run the farm now um, with four kids. Um, and we have Bert's Apple Orchard, which some people are familiar with. But um, And uh, yeah, so I was asked um, by Steve Larrabee, former representative for our towns. and. Uh, back in May if I would like to run and gave it a, about a week to think about it just to see if it made sense for our family and, and whatnot and uh, decided to, to do it. And uh, um, I feel led to, to do it. I, uh, kind of a duty, I think, to, for my community um, um, to, to bring, I think, a voice of common sense and uh, affordability to the state house um, and just kind of practical experience with um, the Vermont landscape, um, running a business, um, and just being educated, you know, in our town and at UVM. So kind of familiar with the education system as well. And so yeah, that's my uh, background and motivation and um, why I think I would be a good candidate um, is. Uh, I mean, I, I do have the background of business, uh, agriculture. I went to UVM for five years for mechanical engineering. Um, I definitely believe in finding simple solutions to problems, and I think that's been part of the success of our farm. Um, and um, I have a family of four children, so I, I understand um, you know, what it's like to have a family in our state. I have two uh, elderly parents who uh, their retirement depends on on the income of the farm. So I know what it looks like to be in that phase of life too, in our communities, and how to how to try to do that well. Um, so I think I have a lot to bring to the table. Um, Kitty Kitty Toll asked me to run, and she asked me before, and I've thought about it. I've gotten a lot of positive feedback from other people, and I think I can do a good job of it. My background is I practiced medicine in St. Johnsbury for about 40 years. Um, I grew up in a small town in south, south central Pennsylvania. I went to a large uh, regional public high school uh, where I knew everybody. And I think that and practicing medicine um, gives me a credential of just being able to get along with all kinds of different people and have to in sometimes a fairly intimate setting. Um, I think that's a good qualification for this job, which I see mainly as listening to people and seeing what they're concerns are and seeing what we can do about it. Um, I think that's probably my strongest point. I have the energy to do it. I'm very healthy. Um, I have the time to do it. I don't have other job uh, requirements. There's home and family, but our kids are grown. My wife supports me, so uh, I think I'm good, good to go. Yes, uh, I, I've been thinking about those things a lot lately. Um, I think we always, I mean, our society is inherently getting more and more complex. Um, so we need to find solutions that mitigate the cost of things, but also solve the problems and, and, create, a, and create good outcomes, right? So um, I think there's a way to do that, and you, you have to figure that out in each situation. Um, with schools, I think that 
I think there's a lot of room from my perspective um, for simplification in what the t is asked of the teachers. Um, I've been listening, I've been going to forums in Cabot with our school and there's been a lot of talk and conversation and meetings about Cabot School in particular and, and um, I've tried to participate in that as much as possible to understand the situation and I am kind of uh, taken back by the the expectation of teachers these days versus what it was when I was in school and I'm just I think there are solutions to remove some of that burden from teachers and find ways to simplify things organize things streamline and and remove some costs there um, also just make life a lot easier for teachers hopefully um, I think that's one way we can save tax dollars and still meet the complexity of our society um, in our schools. That's a huge issue and people are very concerned about it because the, most of the education uh, money comes from the property tax and it can't keep going up like this. People can't afford that. So I don't know the answer to it. The biggest problem I think is a disconnect between uh, raising money and spending it and we got to figure out some way to fix that because it can't go up like this every year. We need excellent schools That's, that will help, help to. One of my goals is to make the, the towns so that people can come back here. If they go away to school or if they stay here, they can thrive. And one thing is it has to be affordable with good education. So I have a, I have a person that works for me right now, a full-time employee, um, who is struggling to find affordable housing. And he has you know, a family, um, and, it's, and it's a real big issue. Um, I think part of it, I've also talked to builders. I've had builders working for me. I have friends who are builders, um, and they, they talk about the struggles on their end. Um, I think that there needs to be at least a, a good conversation between contractors and builders and the state to figure out, okay, what regulations are, are going to help us um, you know, insulate our homes well and reduce our footprint of carbon but at the same time be cost effective and not bog projects down. We, we've got supply chain issues, we've got a lack of labor force for building houses. So the state really needs to f do everything it can to work alongside tradespeople so that they can do their jobs well and streamline things to cut out costs um, that are associated with things like, you know, just supply chain issues or, um, uh, labor issues that they're unnecessary costs. I mean, let's put let's put the money into the into getting good insulation, right? Into good materials. Um, I haven't taken the time to look into state regulations yet and see how that's coming into play in specific laws or regulations or town by town, obviously with different zoning things in towns. But um, I think there's a lot of room for coming alongside people in the trades, and that's going to save money for people that are looking to get into a house, than especially young families. Well, it's necessary to make it attractive for young people, and it's really hard to do. I know where we are in the Northeast Kingdom as well as Cabot, um, you know, real estate values aren't that high, so a builder who wants to build there isn't gonna make the same profit he could make if he built in Chittenden County or in New Hampshire. So that's a huge issue. It's, regulation may be part of it, um, I'm not sure how to get at it. That's one of the biggest things, I think. You know, there are people hired by the hospital that like, decide not to come because they can't find good housing. Um, that's something that I'd like to work on. Uh, but, and I think it's a state issue. It's not a national issue. Um, so I'm not sure how to do it. Come back later and I'll find out. That's a tough, tough issue. Um, I think I would need to learn a lot about, I'm not um, currently in a, in a job or in an environment where I know exactly what the problems are that relate to homelessness exactly. Um, so I think I would need to step into that and, and learn a lot in order to be able to, to answer that question in particular well. Um, offhand, like I said, I do believe in finding simple solutions. Um, and I also believe in you know, what, 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 what ways can we find for, you know, to, to get people to come out of homelessness, right, and and do what they can in our communities to be productive. I 
totally believe in trying to foster productive lifestyle. Um, I see it um, firsthand on our farm. Um, I have had people work for me that are on the fringes of homelessness, and 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 those that you'll see that a lot in in agriculture, where people you know you you put out uh, a job opportunity for some people somebody, and and you learn after getting to know these people like they're on the edge of of homelessness, and so I definitely want to help those people not go into homelessness, right? And and I do know that. It's giving them opportunities to, to have a job, first of all, that fits their needs. So, um, you know, if they're struggling with being on a spectrum of, uh, of psychological um, issues, uh, it's like finding employers that are willing to work with those people and their disabilities um, to, you know, to... to be productive and to feel productive and to offer things to their community, also earning a wage at the same time, which helps them get out of homelessness. So what, pro what programs do we have already in place that are doing that? How could we improve those? I would focus on that. Everybody should at home. That comes first. I'm not sure how to do it. And there's a big problem with, with cost, but it's really important. Um, and it's not just at the homeless, I mean, they need affordable housing. They need housing for seniors. People need to be able to stay in their homes. Um, I don't know the answer. I know it's, it's big, a big issue, um, the support they've given to keep people in their homes or to keep people, provide housing. I mean, that's a baseline. We have to do that. Whether the program they had was the best one, uh, whether we can afford to keep doing it at that level or whether we have to find other ways to do it, um, it's a big problem in Vermont. You see it more probably in the city than you do where we live, but it's, 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 it's a basic human need. Good question. Yeah. Um, certainly I've seen firsthand Cabot and, and Hardwick and all of our surrounding towns have been nailed two years in a row with flash floods. Um, I was driving my dump truck for the town of Cabot for the first two days after the flood last year because they just had so many people that couldn't get out of their road and just have access to food, water, whatever. Um, so I understand, obviously, the destructive force and what that's doing to our towns. Now, in terms of paying for all of this, all the you know remedies to all of these um, problems with these flash floods, uh, that's a good point in terms of um, the gas tax not being able to fund that the way it used to with electric vehicles. Uh, I would probably... Um, I mean, there would be a lot learning curve for me there again to see, okay, what's, what is the state already doing? How are we funding, funding it? And, and, and what are the issues at hand? Um, I think that uh, I do bring mechanical engineering experience to the table. Um, I bring uh, business experience to the table. Uh, I build roads myself. I have an excavator. I have a truck. Um, so I understand the first-hand experience with those things in maintaining roads. Um, I think we do have to find good solutions, obviously, to our infrastructures. I hear what's going on in Burlington with their sewer treatment facilities and lake, you know, the, the water quality at Lake Champlain. It's a huge issue. We have to find a solution to that. To me, that's more important than a lot of other issues that we're finding with the environment. If, we, if we're going to focus on trying to be an environmentally friendly state and, and, and try to be a model for the rest of the country in terms of renewable energy and all that. If, we, if, if, if Burlington continues to put sewer directly into the lake, like that's the first problem we have to attack. So I think that our focus, my focus personally would be on trying to divert money toward municipal infrastructure more so than you know, maybe even a wind project or solar. If, if, if we have to choose between the two at some point, we have to make sure we have, you know, clean water, good roads, and all of our municipal infrastructure operating well. Well, taking the last part first, I think the state is already um, in the process of implementing a tax on electric vehicles based on mileage, which isn't necessarily the perfect solution because some people, some people are driving out of state with their vehicles. Um, 
but that's got to be part of the mix because they don't pay the gas tax. The first part of that was is huge. Um, whether we'll be able to be resilient enough for the next flood, um, you know, climate change has happened. It's happening. It's not going to get any better. The choice is to try to keep it from being worse and how to deal with that. Well, first of all, I think um, anything we can do to support women and and uh, families um, and women that have uh, you know are in the process of, of starting a family and planning a family, um, whatever we can do to to support women in that in that part of their life, I think is crucial. Um, I think there are a lot of programs that um, come alongside women. Um, that are, um, you know, more focused on helping them have their child. Um, and I think, I'm a firm, you know, if, if, if the child is healthy and, and the mother is on the edge of deciding whether or not to have their baby, I think I would love to see more programs that would help that mother make the decision to have the baby in the first place, from my perspective. Um, and then I also think the, the bigger philosophical question behind that is you have, in my mind, you have a, a, a mother who has basic human rights, and then you have a fetus or a, a baby, however you want to look at that. Also, when do we decide that that baby has basic human rights as well? You have two persons that exist simultaneously in one body, both having basic human rights in my mind. So you have to, f the one that's inside the womb doesn't have a voice. A mother obviously does, and we need to affirm that mother's voice all day, every day. But we also need to recognize that, that the baby, at some point we have to decide when does this baby have basic human rights just like the mother. And we have to weigh that. Um, and I think that comes into play. And I think that's what the basic debate is, right? Um, so I lean toward the state's role and what my role would be, would be leaning toward helping mothers make the decision to have their babies as best we can. Obviously, it has to be factoring in the rights of the mother and the needs and the health of the mother and also that of the baby. I think that's already been settled in this state, and I agree with it. I'm very much in favor of, uh, I've seen that given that my four daughters are all in school now, um, and we touched on education, more so on paying for education, but I do see the need for, uh, I would love to be a part of um, trying to improve our schools. Um, from what I've seen, you know, COVID really did a number on things. Um, I know a lot of uh, families that are homeschooling now that I think that are doing it out of uh, finding that they, they need to do it in order to get the kind of education that they want their children to have, which is, uh, and it's a very simple need, which is we want them to be able to read well, write well, and do math well. Um, and my mom was a, a paraeducator for 25 years at Twin Fields School. Um, my wife worked there as well for a few years. Um, and uh, I just, from what I've seen from my experiences, I feel like as an engineer, this kind of like, I, you know, this desire to find simple solutions to improve things continually. I'm just seeing like what I, what I experienced when I was in school versus what I'm seeing now in our public schools is there are some simple solutions that are there that could make for better reading, writing, and arithmetic. And I just see a huge desire among families like mine in our area for that and um, they're and it's tough because not like a lot of these moms and dads are doing homeschool and they don't actually like they didn't see themselves doing that that wasn't their plan and they feel like they have to in order to provide the the education that they think their children should have and I really think that it's time for our state to to come in and, and do something about that. You know, just talking to people, the taxes are a big thing. Um, there are other things. I mean, the cell phone coverage, going from Cabot to Danville to Peachum, mm -hmm. it's not there. And it's a safety issue. 
And you might get around it partly if you get broadband, but that's not gonna help you on the road. On the other hand, given the topography, I'm not sure we can solve that. The, the biggest issue, I think, is, again, trying to make the society such that kids want to come back here. You know, some kids have, but people are leaving. People are concerned their grandchildren are leaving and not coming back. For that matter, older people are concerned their, their property taxes are gonna drive them away. I've run into at least two people who said they're moving away because of that. So there's a lot to, to take care of, but I think housing is big, taxes are big, education's big, healthcare, there's a big things coming up with that too. Um, so I've got a lot to learn. I mean, this is the first time I've done this and I'm sure there are resources to get me better educated. And I, you know, my, my goal is to listen to everybody and um, I can do that. Um, I'm not offended by people that can't stand Democrats. Um, you know, I, I think that we need to work together to get what we can get. <laughs>